Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Let's stand and worship. Let's worship our King and give thanks to our Lord, our God and King. to the educators who taught us how to read, how to learn, and how to make a difference. To the farmers who supply our world and give us the food we need. To the coaches who show us how to work together to achieve our goals. To the medical workers who give health and healing to the hurting. To the architects and builders who create spaces where people can come together. To the artists and musicians who create beauty and inspire us to do great things. To the officers and soldiers who protect our families, our cities, and our nation. To the pastors and church workers who care for our souls. To all who labor, we want you to know. Your work matters. It matters to you. It matters to us, and most importantly, it matters to God.
it's, it's one of those weekends that it, that it marks the end of summer, the beginning of school and fall. It was always, school always began the week after Labor Day, for us at least, where I grew up in Colorado. That's how you mark that summer's over and now we have to go back to school and all that now. Except in Cherry's world, they always went back to school like mid-August because of uh, they lived in farm country. And so things were a little bit different. But uh, Labor Day set aside to remember you know, the, the worker, the laborer, the people, you know, everybody. You know, work, you know, work is more than a four-letter word. You know, I've shared that more than once. It is a gift. It is a gift from God. God intended it. It is part of his plan from the beginning. Uh, I don't think he intended for work to be as hard as it is sometimes, but sin kind of corrupted all of that. But welcome to Labor Day. We have folks that are on the road and traveling. Their last hurrah for the summer, as it were, and they'll be back. But uh, tomorrow, I don't know what your plans are, but take time to give God thanks for the energy that you've got to produce the work that he's given us to do. And you may be retired, but you still have work to do. In fact, I look out there, Buck's been retired for a while, and, uh, and uh, you stay a little busy, don't you, Buck? Yeah, you know, re retirement doesn't mean that you give up. It's just you retire in another area, all right? All right, it's good to see you. Speaking of retirement, speaking of retirement, I regretfully and not welcomely <laughs> Friday accepted a letter from Janice. Janice is going to retire as my secretary and the church secretary. Not happy about that. October 1st, right? All right, so if anybody's interested in maybe stepping in and, and filling those shoes, see me, if you will. Uh, you know, pray about it and see me because uh, that's a big hole, folks. That's a big hole. In the church, you know, in, in the work that gets done here, but, you know, in my world as well, that's a big hole. So uh, uh, we work together for lots of years, lots and lots of years. And uh, Janice, how many is a lot? 22. Yep, everybody, absolutely. Doesn't mean that she's going to stop doing stuff. She's hanging on to a lot of the other hats that she wears. It just the hat that she wears for me. I don't know. Maybe that says something, folks. I don't know. But uh, uh, but uh, she's been threatening me with this for two years now. So I guess the time has come, all right? So uh, be in prayer, all of you, because that is uh, uh, get somebody up to speed to do what she does is going to be... Uh, uh, it's going to be a lot, so we need to find somebody so she can get them up to speed, or I have to beg her to stay on to get somebody up to speed, and beg I will. I'm not ashamed of begging. I can get down on my knees. I can beg, believe me. I'm good at it. <laughs> what was that? No. <laughs> 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 she's got her hands full because she's got to keep Buck in line as well. So she's got her hands well full. So, uh, all right. Last week we began looking at uh, this great, remarkable promise that God gives us in Romans. And we're going to finish that up. I, I, I know some of you said, huh, you didn't finish last week. No, I didn't uh, because there was no way I was going to finish last week. And I knew that when I got started. So, uh, you know, we built upon last week and we're going to, you know, take a look at this golden, this golden chain, the incredible pearls that hang on this chain of salvation and redemption. So if you will, take a look at Romans 8 and we're going to look at those three verses again. Primarily today we're going to be focusing on verses 29 and 30, but it says, we know that God causes all things to work together for good for those that love God and those that are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son so that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he, call, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that as we look at this, we understand that, that the, the life you've given us, the salvation that is ours, redemption, justification, 
Lord, it's such a wonderful, incredible work of God. No man can take credit, Lord, because it's anchored on two ends of eternity, one in eternity past and one in eternity future. And it's all about you. And Lord, that's what we want to make this day, all about you, all about you. Lord, it's not about us, not in the least. It's all about you. Oh, God, may we worship you with our whole heart this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, let's go ahead and sing some more, all right? God bless you all. Let's continue singing Victory in Jesus. the power to break the 
chains of sin and death and rise triumphant from the grave. By faith the church was called to go in the power of the Spirit to the lost to be delivered captives and to preach good news in every corner of the earth we will stand as children of the promise we will fix our eyes on him our souls reward till the race is finished and the work is done we'll walk by faith and not by sight by faith the mountain shall be moved in the power of the gospel shall prevail for we know in christ all things are possible for all who call upon his name we will stand as children of the promise we will fix our eyes on him our souls reward till the race is finished and the work is done we'll walk by faith and not by sight yes we will stand as children of the promise we will fix our eyes on him our souls reward till the race is finished and the work is done. We'll walk by faith and not by sight. We'll walk by faith and not by sight. Splendor of a king, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness dries. Trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. God had three in one. Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. You are. 
is our God. Sing with me how great He's our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. And sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art. Thank you for all that you've done for us. Lord, help us, remind us to, of the glory of you, Lord. Sending your son to die on a cross for our sins. Showing us what love really looks like, Lord. Lord, thank you for all that you've done, Lord. All the great things you are doing. And all the things that you will do, Lord. Help us to lean on your spirit as we get to learn more about your word, Lord. Help us to apply it to our lives. The pastor comes up for the preaching of the message, Lord. Open our hearts, our ears. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. How great is our God. That, of course, is what we'll be talking about today, and I would hope every Sunday, is how great is our God. It's good to see you all this morning. I do pray, uh, ask you to, to pray for me this week. It's going to be kind of a busy week. I uh, want to get around to see some folks, and and uh, uh, week after this, not this week, but next week, I'm going to, my brother, my oldest brother is going to fly in, and I'm going to pick him up at the airport, and uh, Josh is going with us. We're going to drive down Northern California and see my middle brother. It'll be the first time uh, the three of us have been together since Mom's funeral in 2011. So 12 years since the three of us have been together. I've seen Gary. I've seen Tony. But we have not all been together uh, at one place. So we're going to go down, spend a couple of days with him. We nearly lost him last year. You all were so faithful to pray for him, and I appreciate that. Keep praying for him. Pray for his salvation. That's the main thing I want to see is my brother saved uh, before eternity calls. But uh, pray for him. Uh, pray for Gary. Pray for me as we travel. Josh, as he puts up with his three uncles, you know, he doesn't get that opportunity very often, but he's going to get that opportunity. But that means that this week is kind of double duty all the way around because um, I'm going to be taping uh, the five daily messages or uh, studies for Monday through Friday next week, going to do a mini series uh, on uh, on something, and it'll be a surprise to you. So uh, I'm going to tape them. Sherry will broadcast them then, so it'll be all consistent. By the way, I was thrilled. Friday we celebrated uh, a really kind of a milestone in in our uh, in the gospel gleaning. We started it back in uh, April. Uh, March, April of 2000, when the shutdown came up and so many people were in. We never shut down. We always kept the doors open. But uh, we told you all to, to uh, do what is right for yourself. You know, take care of yourself, protect yourself. We started those studies then with the idea of doing it for about a week and a half for Easter. The request was to continue. Could we continue? And I said, well, as long as there's an interest, we will. And the interest has grown and spread quite beyond what I would think. Friday was our 900th consecutive morning Bible study, Monday through Friday. 900. If my guy, God's good, isn't he? 
if my calculations are right, somewhere around mid-February we'll pass 1,000. But you add 170-some uh, Wednesday nights to that, and we're over 1,000 already. And it's just been a labor of love. It's been a lot of fun. But uh, in order to go away and keep everything consistent, then we need to get everything done in advance. And then I want to get everything done so Janice has everything before I leave for the Sunday we come back because I'm going to get back late in the week. So pray for me. It's going to be a busy week. And uh, that's okay. It's a good thing I don't need a lot of sleep, right? You know? Sleep is highly overrated. Highly overrated. All right? Any rate, turn to your Bibles if you will. By the way, if you left your Sunday school book in, 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 in the room, I think there's one left in the seekers room. And uh, if you look and you don't have it, that's where it is. You can go there and find it, all right? Anyway, go to chapter 11, looking at those verses again, that, uh, that, that wonderful, wonderful uh, promise uh, that God has given us. Uh, this one verse, I think, probably contains one of the most precious and powerful promises in all of the Bible. Because it assures us that nothing, absolutely nothing, literally nothing. Can I say it any clearer than that? You know, we get to chapter 9, Paul says, I'm telling you the truth. I mean, I'm really telling you the truth. Let me tell you how I'm telling you the truth. By God, I'm telling you the truth. Listen to me. I'm telling you. So, you know, if, if he can repeat himself three times, I guess I can too, right? I mean, I, it, it's a good bottle of fall. Nothing can derail God's purpose to fulfill every promise that he's given you in, his lo in your life. Nothing. I know some of you have gone through some very difficult times over the last couple of years, and this year hasn't been a, 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 a cakewalk through the park for many of you, but I want you to understand, nothing of that, it, none of that is going to keep God from fulfilling his purpose and plan in your life. Nothing can thwart the plan of God. Last week, we, we, we looked at verse 28. Today, we're going to look at 29 and verse 30, and we're going to begin by looking at God's process in this process of glorification. What is God's process? I read a story one time. I don't know whether you know who Dr. H.A. Uh, uh, Ironside, Harry Ironside was. He was pastor of the Moody Church for a number of years back in the 20s. Dr. Ironside uh, he used to tell about a man who would give his testimony and he would share how God sought him and how God found him and, and how, how God forgave him and cleansed him and put him on his feet and all that God had done for me. After sharing his testimony one day, another gentleman came who apparently had a little different slant on theology than he did and he said, he said I, I really enjoyed your testimony, but he said, he said, you left your part out of it. He said, salvation is part God and part you, and you left your part out of it. And he said, oh, I apologize. I really do. He said, uh, I, I should have mentioned that my part was running away, and God's part was finding me and catching me. And isn't that the truth? My part is running away, but God searches to and fro upon the whole earth to find those whose hearts are turned toward him. Look at verse Verses 29 and 30 again. For those whom he foreknew, he predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And this, these whom he justified, he also glorified. I get a kick out of reading a lot of different uh, commentaries and sermons and things and, and series. And, and, and you get in that and you see... You know, how many people will, will preach through Romans 8 until they get to this section and then they take a hiccup and move right on past that? Because they don't want to, they want to tackle, tackle, you know, what these verses, the implications of these verses, because they really challenge us at, at, at a basic core. Uh, you could call these verses the golden chain of salvation. On that chain hangs five precious pearls. When you get through with it, there's one thing I think is perfectly clear. When you understand it and you get through it, our arrival and glory is all about God. Our salvation is all about Him. He is the center, the core, and the heart of it all. There is nothing that we can do short of surrendering up to Him because God has done it all. you got to know, folks, dead folks can't raise dead folks. So I could not bring myself out of that, 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 that dead, sinful state 
It took an agency far outside me with the power to do it, and that is our Almighty God. So let's go through this process a little bit. Let's join Paul and watch God at work. The, the first pearl on that string is, is that little word foreknowledge. How many of you like that word? For whom he foreknew the foreknowledge of God. Romans 8 and 29 says, for those whom he foreknew. Now, when you think about God's foreknowledge, what usually comes to mind? I talk to people. I, in fact, I asked a number of people uh, that question over the last few weeks. And generally, the answer I get is, well, God looked down through history. He looked down you know, through, through the scope of history, and he saw those people that would choose him and those people that would, would, would accept him, and, and so he foreknew them. He knew beforehand that they were going to choose him, so he predestined them based upon the, the choice that they were going to make. In other words, what they're saying is God chose us uh, long ago because... He knew that we'd choose him one day, which in reality roots salvation in the decision of man rather than the pleasure of God. Think about that implication, if you will, in a minute. Because I, I, I am one who thoroughly disagrees with that. I'm going to share with you why. You see, why he certainly does, and, and I do, I, I believe that God knows everything. He's, he's omniscient. He knows every choice that I'm going to make in life. And, and, and he can look back and forth throughout history. He can observe what man does and does not do. But I don't think that's what Paul's talking about. I really don't. And, and we need to understand it. When, when God... When it says God foreknew us, it doesn't mean that he knew the decision that we would make about Jesus one day. Rather, I, I, I think he's using a, a, the virtual synonym for love. Because every time you find this in the Bible, it means that, that, that one, it, it literally means one, it means to set one's affection and delight in someone with a personal interest. Adam knew Eve, and they begat. It's that, that terminology that we have to come to grips with. And when you take this word apart, even in the Greek, you, you, you get that understanding. It gives us a deeper insight into what Jesus meant when he, when he spoke in judgment. And he said, you know, depart from me. I never knew you. Now, does that mean that God had no understanding or knowledge of them? Of course not. God's omniscient. He knows everything. He knows all there is you know, to know. He knows man. He knows every person that is born in this world. What he's saying is, I, I never have had this personal and intimate relationship with you. Or Paul speaks of it. He uses the same term. Listen, in, in Romans 11 and verse 2, he says, God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. In other words, there's a people out there, the Jewish people that, that, that he knew and he loved before time. In fact, he says, I, I called you because I love you. He knew them. It means he has foreloved us. God's foreknowledge means that he foreloved us and his, he set his affection and his love on us. And then out of that great love, he predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son. Now, my friends, this is absolutely commitment, consistent with other places. In, for example, in Ephesians chapter 1, as Paul, <coughs> Paul writes in verses 4 and 5, he, cho <coughs> excuse me, he, chose us, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. Now, I, I hate sometimes when verses, when they set verse breaks, when you look at your, your Bible, you'll see that, uh, uh, that in love is, is, is in the, the previous verse. But it, it's a sentence. It says, in love, he predestined us to the adoption of sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to his kind intention of his will. In love. Before the world ever began, God loved you. You see, the Bible, to know is to love. Now, if you're wondering if this really matters, I would tell you it, it absolutely does. 
because verses 29 and 30 tell us that the, it, it, that the foreknowledge of God is the very beginning of this golden chain and the first pearl that hangs on the chain. How do we define foreknowledge and why it matters? It's because it sets the tone. It sets the tone for the whole course. If foreknowledge is all about us and our choice of God, then it all then, then all the rest that God does really begins with us. We become the first cause. We become the initiator in all of this, which in effect makes man the center of, of salvation, makes man the center of all things rather than God. And folks, anytime we replace God with man, we got a problem. Anytime we pull God down in any way from that lofty position that he holds in creation, in, 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 in all things, and we elevate man even in the least to, as we bring God down, we have a problem. Our worship becomes incredibly faulty at that point. God is sovereign. We can't lose sight of that. Foreknowledge refers to God setting his affection on his people before the world was ever made. So if we were uh, to reword verse 29 uh, to display what that means, it says, For those whom God uh, intimately set his affection upon, he also predestined. We can know that God's going to accomplish his good purpose in us because in eternity past he knew us. You see, our salvation is anchored in eternity past before the world was ever created. Our salvation is anchored there. He set his affection on you. How does that make you feel? I mean, and think about it just for a minute. When you really come to grips with that, that God loved you before he created this whole mess. So he didn't create a mess. He created something perfect. We made the mess. All right? But before it all, and even knowing what I would do with my life and the things and the mistakes and the things that I did, he still loved me. And in the economy of God, Jesus still died for me before the creation of the world. Because is he not the lamb slain before the foundation of the world? Now, that leads us to the second pearl in that strand. And of course, that second pearl is predestination. You see, he knew you and loved you before the foundation of the world and, and it was ever laid and then he says in verse 29, and also, he said, those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Now, just as soon as we hear that word, see, that's another word we have struggles with, isn't it? Because usually when we hear that word, the first thing we say is, oh, 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 okay, that means that, that uh, uh, God has said those people over there are going to go to heaven, and those people over there are going to go to hell, you know. God predestined some to heaven and predestined some to hell. But you will never, <coughs> never find in Scripture where predestination is ever linked with hell. Never. Never. It is not. It is never applied to the unbeliever. And it is never applied to hell in Scripture ever. It simply means that in eternity past, God made a decision about you. He loved you, and, and, and he made a decision about what was going to happen to you. All whom God foreloved, he predestined, and that word means exactly what it appears to be. Pre-meaning beforehand, destined, meaning there's a set destination that you have. God set our destination beforehand. When I get out to the airport and I get on an airplane, it's nonstop to New York City. Now, earthly 
illustrations always fall short because we know something can happen and interrupt the flight midway. But nothing goes on. I'm predestined to get off that plane in New York. There's a predetermined destination for me when I get on that plane. When I come to Christ, there's a predetermined destination. That Greek word is prohorasian. Do you hear the main word in that? Horizon? Horizon. We get the word horizon from that. And that's exactly what it means. It means that, that, that God determined our horizon and then set sail toward it. And we are going to come out in the end with what God predetermined we would be. He decided that uh, he would use every circumstance in your life, every problem, every good thing, every bad thing. He, he determined to use all of these to accomplish his great purpose so that we'd be conformed into the image of his son. Everything that you've gone through in life, You've gone through, and God's using every bit of it as a purpose to chisel away everything that looks like you so that more and more of Jesus will be seen in you. And I think that's a beautiful thing. You know, when I go into problems, that makes my problems manageable. Think about it. If you go into a circumstance, if you go into a problem, I don't care how great or mighty or, or gigantic or teeny-weeny that problem may be, if you go into it with that kind of mindset that, hey, God has a purpose, and that purpose is that through this, he is making me more like his son. That makes every problem I got manageable, every single one of them. Because you probably verify this, half of the problems, the, the, the greatest battle in, in getting to an answer of a problem is right here. How you think about it. How you enter into it. If you go into it with the idea that, that it's going to kill me, it's going to drive me, that's exactly what it's going to do. But when you understand that that problem is there and God is going to use it to shape you, to mold you, to sand you up, to buff you up so that you're a little bit more like him. Why does God conform us to the image of his son? Well, he says so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And, and, and here's the purpose in that golden chain. To make more brethren. That's perfectly consistent with what the writer of Hebrews says. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10, it says, For it's fitting for him, speaking of Jesus, for whom are all things and through whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory perfect the author of their salvation through suffering. What's Jesus doing? He came, he came as a man. Why? That he might bring many sons, and we can say sons and daughters because it's a generic term, to glory. So what is he doing? He's shaping you like Jesus here so that through you he might work in such a way that he might draw many sons and daughters. Remember the little illustration that I gave you a long time ago about when they were building St. Patty's Cathedral in New York, and a guy was walking along, and uh, and he saw this guy he's looking through the scope, and you know he's going over and chiseling a little rock here, and he go over and look, and he chisel, and he finally asked the guy, he said, what, "What are you doing?" And he said, "Here, go to look." And he says, "Up there, close to the spire, just under the spire, you see that 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 vacant place up there?" He said, "Yeah." He says, well, this stone belongs up there, and I'm shaking, shaping the stone down here so that it'll fit up there. That's what God's doing. He's shaping us here so that we fit there. He's predestined that. That's your predetermined course. Being conformed to the image of Christ doesn't mean that we're going to be carbon copies of Jesus with physical structures uh, you know, or that we have uh, you know, the same personality. No, but it does mean that we're going to have the same basic character. You see, that he has very good, you know, love and, 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 and graciousness and gentleness and unselfishness and patience and kindness and compassion and, uh, and, and, and most significantly of all, his holiness. That's the course. 
at the predetermined course that God has given us. And, 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 and when God created man, he made him in his own image. But the, 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 the image was marred by sin. But God in the process, is in the process of restoring that bit by bit, transforming us in the same image from glory to glory. And one day, one day, he will finish the job of making us perfectly like Christ that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And God's plan is to make many more sons and daughters just like Jesus in order to further exalt and magnify him by showing his glory. How? By bringing many sons to glory. Though the first two pearls are foreknowledge and predestination, the third pearl, well, I bet you could guess what it is. It's calling. It's calling. This pearl moves us out of the realm of eternity past and brings us up to, 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 to the present. In, into the very realm of today. This is what brings us to Christ. For whom he, you know, he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed into the image of his son, you know, and so forth. And he says, and who he be predestined, he also, what? He called. The effectual, wonderful call of God. God's foreknowledge and his predestination occurred before time began. But God's calling happened in your lifetime, in your life, in, in, in time and space at a particular time. For me, it was on the back steps of a Sunday school building of the first church that we ever attended. That was where it was for me. That was time and space for me. Where was it for you? It is that gracious invitation. Certainly, but it is that effectual calling that results in something happening within us. Faith being sparked and, and grace entering in. There's a sense in which the invitation goes out to all. You know, it, it, it's this external call. Jesus said many are called, but few are chosen. There's this gracious internal call that, that, that brings about power and conviction within our heart. Why is it that two people can sit and listen to the same, same message and one person fall deeply under conviction and the other person say, huh, that didn't mean anything. They both heard the same thing. But there's something powerfully going on in the heart and the life of the one who is falling under the conviction of that message. The internal call, therefore, is just simply a, a command of God that all men everywhere should repent and believe in order that they might be saved. And anyone can respond to that call, if only they will. This call, though, though ex ex external, it, it, it can be rejected. It can be refused. Many do. But this internal call, could be defined as the, God's summons, his, his wooing power, his drawing power by which God not only invites a person externally to the gospel, but it means that the Holy Spirit internally begins to enable that person to reach out and receive. It's the word of God. We were dead in our trespasses and sins until, you know, God and His Spirit. No man comes unto the Father, but the Spirit of Him who sent me, draw Him. It is this drawing, this magnetic, this wooing, loving power of God working through the Holy Spirit in the heart of an individual. Tended with the spoken word of God is the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit, which secures this positive, saving response from the one who is called. Listen, Paul speaks of this when he, when he writes in glowing terms to that church in Thessalonica, in 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 5. He says, for your gospel, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but listen to this, but also in, the, in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. Listen, you heard all the right words. You heard it all, but you didn't just hear it. Something happened inside of you. There was the power of, of God. There was the movement of the Holy Spirit that brought full conviction to your heart. And, and, and the message says it put, it put steel in your backbone. Conceivably, then, the gospel may indeed come to, to, to many in word only. Uh, that is, externally. They hear it with the ears. 
but they don't receive it with a heart. Have you ever wondered why one person isn't hearing and another person is? Maybe we need to pray for those lost people that their ears would be unstopped, that their eyes would be open, that their hearts would, that, that God would be able to, to break open the hardness of their heart and move within them and draw them. It should give us a greater passion for evangelism and for the lost, knowing where the need is as we pray for them. This call, this invitation to come to Christ is to receive the forgiveness of sin. and not, It's not restricted to one group or one age group or class or nation or people. No, it's to everyone who will believe. Not all are convinced of their need. Not all are drawn by the Holy Spirit to trust Christ and salvation. But all who were foreknown by Him and predestined by Him, not one will be lost. Come. Now here's the beauty of the promise. One hundred percent of the people that God has foreknown will end up coming to that beautiful, glorious state that we're headed for. And that you know, opens up this next pearl. Next pearl then is is very logically justification. Is that not right? This glorious pearl brings this this very theme of the whole letter that Paul is writing. In fact, just about every letter Paul writes to the forefront. And those whom he called, he also justified. Now we don't have to go through this a lot. We've certainly spent a great deal of time over the past uh, ooh, weeks and months uh, looking at justification because it is it is one of the main themes in, in, in all of Paul's writing here. It isn't necessary to spend time explaining. We know exactly what that is. In Romans 5 and 1, you see, it, is, it says that, uh, that therefore having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Justification is that legal declaration by God that, that the righteousness of the Son of, of God, of Jesus Christ, has been imputed, it's been reckoned to my life, to your life. So that we stand in the presence fully accepted and fully forgiven and, and, and we stand in faith and faith alone with absolutely nothing that we can add to it. You see, it isn't we aren't justified by, by faith and, and baptism or faith and the Lord's Supper or faith and works or faith or anything else. We are justified by grace through faith. That not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. Not of works. We would end up boasting. For we are God's workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus. And we've been given a work to do given from the foundation of the world, that we should walk in them. We are justified by faith. The sinner who trusts Christ as Savior receives God's gracious hand uh, uh, from him, the, the very gift of righteousness, which allows God to declare him righteous, right before God, and just even as a sinner. Paul simply can't get away from justification, can he? He can't, and neither can we. He mentions it here because justification is bound up in God's sovereign purpose and plan, which means God's sovereignty isn't some kind of side issue. Again, folks, when you go to that arch and that keystone up there, I say it again, the sovereignty of God is that central keystone in that arch. And the more weight we put upon the sovereignty of God, the stronger and more unshakable our lives become. In fact, Peter places the divine sovereignty forefront in this whole process, does he not? In his sermon on the day of Pentecost, it's in your, on your word guide, but you can, you can go ahead and look at it in Acts 22, verses 22 through 24. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. Then he says this, this man, speaking of Jesus, delivered over by what? The predetermined plan and what? For knowledge of God. That kind of spells it out, don't you think? 
you nailed to the cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it is impossible for him to be held in its power. Do you see how it all comes together so beautifully? So when we explain predestination in the gospel, is it mentioned, then something, my friends, is wrong. Justification is a gift of God given to those who embrace the Son of God and is ever and always bound up in God's sovereign purpose for your life. What God has joined together, let no man tear apart. That brings us to the final pearl. Now here we go, folks. We're leaving the present. Glorification. That's exactly right. You see, that's the simplest outline I think I've ever put together. I mean, it just spells itself out. I don't have to work at it. I don't even have to find alliteration. It just is all right there. We started in eternity past, didn't we? With foreknowledge and predestination, we moved to the present. But now guess what? This whole golden chain stretches all the way out to eternity future and is anchored there. People, your salvation is anchored in eternity past and eternity future. How secure is that? We reach a goal. When we reach that goal, the whole process, as it were, God's purpose for our life comes to full fruition. For whom he justified, he says, he also glorified. In this life, we're constantly plagued with sin. We face circumstances uh, uh, and consequences of our sin and the sins of others. We battle that. We're going to be in chapter 7 the, the rest of our life on this earth. We're going to be chapter 6 and chapter 7, chapter 8. We know that. And this happens even though the power, the penalty of sin has been dealt with by Jesus upon the cross. And he's delivering us from the power of sin now. We're out from under the penalty of sin. But to be glorified is to be entirely freed from the presence of sin, entirely made new as we enter into the presence of God. In a very real sense, glorification is that grand finale of the Christian life. Do you find it strange that Paul makes that past tense? Do you see that? Whom he justified, he also glorified. Past tense. Do you find that odd? It shouldn't be because what he's saying is it's an already accomplished fact in the very heart and mind of God. It has been done since eternity past. You are glorified. You may not experience it right now. You'll experience it another time. But you see, it is already accomplished. In the heart and mind of God, it's done. It's done. Now, if something is already finished and accomplished in the heart and mind of God, how can you lose it? How can you undo it? Over the years, I've had the very great privilege of sharing you know, with people because they say, oh, you're one of them Baptists that think once saved, always saved. No, I said, I don't. And they back up and they look at me real funny. I'm a Baptist that don't believe in once saved, always saved. No, I just simply believe once saved, period. Why do you have to put a qualifier on it? When I'm saved, it's rooted in Christ. And for me to lose my salvation, Christ would have to be dethroned. He'd have to cease becoming the Son of God, and that's just not going to happen. We could say Paul is so certain of a believer's final glorification that he writes as if it's already occurred. This is why, uh, you know, why Paul is so certain of everything, because, uh, because the sovereign purpose of God is invincible. Can't be altered. Can't be, you know, nobody can thwart the purpose of God. Scripture tells us that. Paul writes to the church in, in, in Philippi in, in chapter 1, verse 6, in the Amplified, I love it. It says, I am convinced and confident. I love that. I'm not only convinced, but I'm confident of this very thing that he who begun a good work in you will continue to perfect and complete it until the day of Jesus Christ, the time of his return. What does that say to you? 
and said, if God started this thing, God's going to finish it. If you got into a relationship with God, i got to tell you, folks, you're already at the end of the journey. Oh, you've got a few steps to take yet. I understand that. But you can rest assured when the world's collapsing in and, uh, and, and, and the roof is falling in on your life that, that God's purpose is not thwarted by that because you are already in the heart and mind of God a glorified individual. All those who foreknew, he predestined. All those he predestined, he called. All those he called, he justified. All those he justified, he glorified. He pulls back the curtain for us and reveals what he's been doing all along in your life and in mine. This is what this is what all creation has been eagerly waiting for that Paul talks about in verse 19. This is, what, this is what we personally anticipate that he mentions in verse 23. This is what the Spirit is praying for in verse 26. And this is the purpose for which God called you in verse 28 to 30. You are glorified. Verse 30, we've arrived, complete conformity to the image of the glorified Christ. Gloriously transformed body, united with perfect souls and spirits, which will all reflect the very glory of Almighty God. Folks, you've arrived. The chain is complete. All pearls hang that golden chain. Every event in your life designed and structured by God to help you along the path toward that goal. So viewing every circumstance in that light will keep you moving in the direction and keep you growing in Christ's likeness. And that's why it's so important to understand the Word of God. Important to see what it says and how it relates to us. Now we know why we're here. Are we fulfilling God's goal? Are we living according to that purpose? Are we yielding up to Him as He shapes us and molds us and makes us? After all, reflecting His glory by expressing His likeness is God's purpose for your life. That's why He saved you. That's why He left you here. Would you stand and bow your heads? It all begins, my friends, with trusting Christ. It all begins when you know that the Spirit of God is drawing you to Himself. And I can tell you, I, I don't know many of us that don't know what it feels like to feel the burden and conviction of sin. That's just the Holy Spirit saying, I love you. That's just God saying, I'm here for you. Will you give your life to me? Will you surrender to me? Will you take your hands off and say, no more me, all of you? I shared an illustration in the Philippines last night. That's why I got jack lagged this morning. I shared with him about a little boy who a neighbor invited to VBS. And the little boy came to vacation Bible school, never been in church. And he got saved during Bible school, and he was so excited. So the next Sunday, that very next Sunday, he went with the neighbors to church, and he's sitting in the church, and he's watching everybody, and they're singing songs, and he's so full because of what God had done in his life. Little 12-year-old boy, and the offering plate comes by, and he sees people putting money in the offering plate, and he reaches in his pocket, and he doesn't have anything. And the plate comes to him, the little boy sets it on the floor, and he stands in the place and says, God, I don't have any money, but I'll just give you all of me. Are you willing to give all of me to the one who gave his all for you? Father, I thank you for these moments. Now, God, work in our hearts as you have purposed even from the foundation of the world. Let us hear you. And let us, Lord, be obedient to that that drawing and the moving of the Spirit. If there's anybody here or listening that doesn't know you, that this is the day, Lord, you're calling to them. I think of that invitation, calling, calling. You're calling to them. Oh, God, we come. Let these moments be moments of decision for each and every one of us. Those who need to come to you, those who need to come home to you, those that need a church home, those that there's another decision that needs to be made. God.
God, you know what it is. Speak to our heart, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you. Make that decision. Whatever he's leading, sharing, saying to you, give it up. Give it up to him. I'm going to be right here as we sing. Would you come? Join me. We'll pray. I'll help you through whatever decision others will. Would you come? What's God saying as we sing? forgiven because you were forsaken I'm accepted you were condemned I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were condemned. I'm alive and well. Your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true, and it's my joy to honor you. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true, and it's my joy to honor you in all you were forsaken I'm accepted you were condemned I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again amazing love how can it be you, my King, would die for me. Amazing love, I know it's true. And it's my joy to honor you. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me. Amazing love, I know it's true, and it's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. It's you
It's my joy to honor you. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true. And it's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you in all I do. I honor you. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for this worship. Thank you for our assembling together. Thank you for our watchers on the broadcast. Thank you for those that are all here. Thank you most of all, Lord, that you have met with us today. May we go out honoring you truly in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. It's so good to see you all today. Share your love with us. Is there fellowship this afterwards? Okay, I didn't know whether it would be for uh, the holiday or not. So there's still fellowship. There's coffee, donuts, get to know. Meet one another, greet one another, say hi to one another, and sing us out, y'all. Okay. Thank you. They're dismissed. Have a nice week. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For he is good, he is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. The mighty hand and outstretched arm, his love endures forever. For the life that's been reborn. His love endures forever. Praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Forever God is faithful. Forever God is strong. Forever God. To the setting sun, his love endures forever. By the grace of God, we will carry on. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing.